There's an ongoing debate in the field of psychedelic research regarding the subjective psychedelic experiences and their role in producing the therapeutic outcomes. In this video, I will be discussing some ideas related to how psychedelics may work and whether the psychedelic effects are truly required for the therapeutic outcomes. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala. I'm a neuropharmacologist studying the mechanisms of drug action in the brain. Today I will discuss some of the hypotheses related to psychedelic drugs and their therapeutic effects. Psychedelic drugs like psilocybin or LSD are also known as serotonergic hallucinogens. They are a large class of substances known for their powerful psychotropic effects, altering perception, mood and cognition. These drugs represent a very promising class of drugs for the treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders. In particular, many recent studies have shown that psychedelic drugs have potential in the treatment of depression. But we really don't know how the therapeutic effects of these drugs emerge. Most classical psychedelics are thought to produce the majority of their effects through actions on the serotonin 5-HT2A receptors, where they act as agonists. The importance of these receptors for the psychedelic effects have been established in studies where subjects received an antagonist of the 5-HT2A receptors and this effectively prevented the psychedelic effects. While the psychedelic experience as such can have a profound psychological impact, recent studies also suggest that these drugs may facilitate mechanisms of, for example, neural plasticity that could contribute to their therapeutic action. Since the study of psychedelic drugs and their effects on the brain and mind can be evaluated at many levels, there are many hypotheses aiming to explain their therapeutic potency. Here I will discuss three ideas, and for the sake of clarity, I will be presenting simplified uh, stances, more clear-cut versions of these ideas. I ask you to check out the original publications which I have listed in the description and down below for more precise depictions of these hypotheses and ideas. The first hypothesis is that the most important contributor to the therapeutic effects of psychedelics is the subjective experience itself. The idea here is that psychedelics are able to produce psychological change through the subjective experience itself, perhaps supported by the help of a psychotherapist. Proponents of this line of thinking include notable researchers in the field like Roland Griffiths. It's clear that these deeply profound, sometimes life-changing experiences are the most obvious candidate for explaining the therapeutic potential of psychedelic drugs. Indeed, many of the recent studies have aimed at evaluating the quality of the subjective experience and its relation to the therapeutic outcomes. While these studies have given us many interesting insights, and they do suggest that there is a connection between the experience and the therapeutic outcome, it's still rather unclear whether the experience itself is truly required. One argument against this idea is that there are also many other putative rapid-acting antidepressant treatments that do not produce any particular type of subjective experience or their psychotropic effects are very different from those of psychedelic drugs. For example, treatments like transcranial magnetic stimulation, sleep deprivation, electroconvulsive therapy and subanesthetic ketamine infusions all produce antidepressant outcomes. There's even preliminary evidence that some other anesthetic drugs like propofol, nitrous oxide or isoflurane anesthesia may possess therapeutic effects and it can be argued that their subjective effects are nothing like those of psychedelics. For example, in the case of deep anesthesia, there's a lack of experience. 
However, some of these experimental treatments may turn out to be ineffective when more clinical studies are conducted. And some of these treatments, like sleep deprivation, only produce very transient antidepressant effects. One important counterargument here is that the subjective psychedelic experience may be particularly important for producing the sustained antidepressant outcomes that psychedelics may possess. But I don't think we have enough clinical evidence to truly assess that question yet. It is plausible that the mechanism of action of psychedelic drugs is more dependent on the experience. But it is also possible that a variety of these different treatments share a common neurobiological mechanism which ultimately produces the therapeutic outcomes. This is essentially our second hypothesis, a more biomedically oriented perspective. It states that psychedelics act on neurobiological mechanisms that may, for example, promote plasticity and alter brain connectivity in ways that result in the reduction of depressive mood. Indeed, many studies suggest that there are certain mechanisms that may be shared by various different treatments of depression. One idea, which I am also a proponent of, is that psychedelics and many other drugs facilitate certain patterns of neural activity and plasticity, ultimately leading to the amelioration of depressive symptoms. Here, the subjective psychedelic experience is a byproduct of neural activity, which underlies the therapeutic mechanism itself. But it doesn't mean that the psychedelic experience doesn't contribute to the therapeutic outcome. On the contrary, throughout our lives, our brains are in constant change through mechanisms of neural plasticity, which are guided by our interactions with both our internal and external worlds. So, while this idea suggests that the therapeutic outcomes are not primarily produced by the experience, but can be also achieved by, for example, brain stimulation, the experience may still play a key role in producing the ultimate outcome. And it is precisely that interconnection which may indeed be why psychedelics could be particularly effective in treating certain conditions. This also means that if the subjective psychedelic effects are an outcome of the same neuropharmacological activation that is required for the cellular and molecular effects to emerge, it is unlikely that the psychedelic effects can be removed without removing the therapeutic effects. The third hypothesis takes a more reductionist approach and proposes that psychedelic substances may produce their therapeutic effects by acting through specific mechanisms that may not require the emergence of the subjective psychedelic experience. To some extent, this recapitulates the classical pharmacological approach, where drugs bind to certain targets to produce certain therapeutic outcomes. One proponent of an idea somewhat like this is David Olson, who started using the term psychoplastogen to describe psychoactive substances that have neuroplasticity promoting effects. While I find this term rather arbitrary, the recent studies investigating the plasticity promoting effects of psychotropic drugs are indeed very interesting. For example, these studies have shown that several psychedelic drugs have the ability to promote dendritic branching and synapse formation in both cell cultures and in rodents. Essentially, these effects resemble those of ketamine, with many of the intracellular cascades being quite similar. Indeed, some rodent studies suggest that the activation of certain molecular signaling pathways and other cellular mechanisms are causally connected to the antidepressant-like behavioral effects in rodents. Then again, there's a significant translational gap in bringing potential preclinical drug candidates to actual clinical use. 
Within this line of thinking, one goal is to produce new substances that lack the psychoactive effects but retain the therapeutic action. While some of you may think that this idea is immediately appalling, it is important to remember that psychedelic drugs are unlikely to be viable treatment options for all patients. So a non-psychedelic drug that still retains the therapeutic effects would allow the treatment of more patients, and I think that is ultimately a very good thing. As far as I've understood, the recent studies from the Olson lab suggest that they have already synthesized uh, non-psychedelic drugs that retain the antidepressant-like effects, at least in rodent models. With the current fast pace of psychedelic research, I'm sure that in the, let's say, upcoming five years or so, we'll be much closer to understanding the therapeutic mechanisms of psychedelic drugs. But in the meantime, all we can do is more research. I'd be happy to hear your thoughts on the mechanisms of psychedelic drugs, so feel free to leave a comment down below. Also, I'd appreciate if you smash the like button like never before, and press subscribe if you'd like to see more future neuropharmacology content. Thank you for watching, and until next time.